Uh, oh, Jerry, boy. you touched on this. No, 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 don't worry, don't worry. You touched on it during your formal remarks, um, and you might have to reach back into your legal background at Cornell, but what do you see as the future of free speech and rock and roll? Well, I was, I was sitting there thinking, Paul and Jim and Gary, that if there's any opportunity besides the big celebration that we're going to be doing around the 100th anniversary, if there's some chance for myself or somebody with me to come back and talk about freedom of speech relative to performing musical arts, I'd love to do that somewhere during that course of the year because I think it would be appropriate. Um, as I've said, unlike the visual arts, uh, no matter how much you might find uh, disgusting some of the work that's been done over time in photography or you know, three-dimensional art of painting or sculpture, artists were always free to create that art and their difficulty was finding a place to display it. Now we know over the last 20 years or so, 30 years, there's been a, a lot of discussion and argument about where you can put this government funding of these issues. But surprisingly, until the late 80s, there wasn't the ability to have freedom of speech in the recording industry. You, um, the blues were first recorded in 1920, and all through the 20s and 30s and 40s and up until the 50s, almost exclusively on the record, it says not licensed for airplay. Didn't matter what it was about, it just nobody wanted to hear this African American art form on the radio. It was supposed to be on a jukebox or played in the house, and that was the only thing. Along come the 50s, and suddenly uh, you have black owned radio stations, you have white owned radio stations playing black music, you have Alan Flea playing. And this starts to get out in the public and, and raises hell, as we all know. It's caused all the problems. Alan Free was attacked partly because of that when he was attacked about payola. That's, he wasn't, it wasn't just because he was taking money to play records. It isn't until the 80s that we really get serious discussions about fixing this when you have people like Frank Zappa and Dee Snyder from Twisted Sister going to Congress and testifying about this freedom of speech should prevail in this musical art form, and it should be up to the consumer to make the decision about whether or not they wanted to take in these words or these ideas. And it really sort of all comes to a head with uh, some of the hip hop groups in the late 80s like NWA, who will be eligible in a couple of years for induction, uh, who really pushed the envelope, like it or not, about being able to say whatever they wanted to say on a CD, and it being up to the consumer, the mother, the child, whoever bought that, whether or not they would hear it. Um, I think we've come a long ways in that area. I don't see us backtracking. Uh, you probably, uh, and if you don't know, Avery is one of the uh, great uh, civil rights individuals in our city and around the country and speaks on these kinds of subjects all the time on CNN and other, other places. And I'm just hoping that we have the ability to make that more part and integrate it into what the history of this music is so that people understand it. We have a display, um, what's the name of it, Jim? Uh, don't, knock, don't Knock the Rock, which talks about freedom of speech and censorship. And we're very proud of that. It's a very integral part of the museum, has been since it opened, always will be. And it's one that we take very seriously and one that, as I said earlier, antagonizes many visitors, both in that exhibit but also in the movies where sometimes some of the content's a little racy. We always have posted, we have warnings posted, whether it's R-rated or whatever. We don't try to go over the top with any of this in the museum itself per se. But I, I, think, I think we've come a long ways, and I'd like to think that it would be, we would be part of the sustaining of that. We've... We support that in what we do. We don't, we don't have a flag waving every day, but certainly the museum stands for that. Mr. Stewart, uh, you mentioned how much the mission of the Rock Hall has changed over the past 15 years to include education and philanthropy. What directions do you see the Rock Hall going over the next 15 years? Um, the mission probably never changed. The vision of what the museum was going to be kind of changed from that strat plan. when. I think when I, that first strategic plan doesn't have a real mission statement. It has some words in there, but it said educate, but educate was going to be from walking through the museum, not from virtually using the music to teach all the subject matters that we talked about. Uh, I see that musical, uh, that educational aspect continuing to grow. Uh, we are only limited by people resources and financial resources of reaching more states, and uh, especially online. Uh, we physically don't have enough space to reach more kids in, the, in classrooms. We never had classrooms. We have to shut a theater down to teach a class. And uh, we have uh, one of our educators here, Jason Hanley, who's uh, uh, very instrumental in, in creating those classes. And uh, also you do occasionally get online and teach, right? 
And we, we would like to see that aspect of the museum grow and grow and grow because it shows the power of this music that we call, however you define rock and roll, in the sense that every kid in every class that Jason teaches wants to answer every question. They're, tr they're totally involved. You don't see that. There's nobody looking for the answers on the ceiling like this, you know? <laughs> Folks are in there. So it, we know how well it works. We've been recognized by the educators and other institutions for the validity of this approach. So we got to keep doing that. But we need more space to eventually do more. So we need classrooms. Uh, Linda, Linda needs classrooms. She doesn't have enough. So we're hoping to eventually, as I said, connect between the two institutions, build enough uh, uh, flexible space that we can have classrooms and have a, um, a full-time temporary exhibit gallery. When Jim Hinkey came here, he, uh, he got here before the museum was built. He's our chief curator. He, asked, he thought there were two things. They needed a temporary gallery, which we don't have, and they needed a performance space, which we don't really have. We make do with a theater. We make do with a stage. Uh, all these elements need to be looked at when we expand between ourselves and the Science Center. And that will be a joint project that Linda and I will take on together because we're going to have to share that space and we'll have to share the operating costs. So it's much like when we built the library recently, not only did we have to raise the funds for the library, the library costs roughly a million dollars a year to run and libraries don't generate revenues. They just don't. They don't subsidize themselves. So we had to raise the operating reserve to support that. So when we get ready to expand between the two buildings, we're going to have to raise not only the capital to build it, we're going to have to raise the money to run it. So educationally, we need more space. Um, and uh, I think it's just keep on doing what we're doing. Uh, I think there's a great future for the museum and the ability to continue to build more exhibits, travel more exhibits, and just get this message out around. I think we have, we have a mission that's not going to change. We just have one that we have to do a better job of taking to the people, wherever they are. Mr. Stewart, and this is a, truly a short one, but uh, should be fun. What is a favorite exhibit for you, and why is it especially meaningful in the museum? Well, it's pr I usually people ask me a question. It's usually not an exhibit. It's an artifact or two. And I have two big favorites. Uh, one of them is down right now because of the redesign, but it's um, Howling Wolf didn't believe in banks. He's a great blues man, which put him ahead of the curve. Sorry, Paul. Uh, and uh, he used to keep all of his cash in a suitcase and carry it with him everywhere he went and put it underneath his chair. And when we went to get material from Howling Wolf's widow, he had passed away by then when the museum opened, our curator went up and got the instruments and the clothing and all the normal stuff. And she said, you forgot the most important thing. And he says, nothing up there but the old suitcase. So we went back and got it. And when he brought it down, he told Mrs. Burnett, uh, the widows, that, you know, that it's full. What's in there? And she said, I don't know, I put it up there after he died. And so they opened up with great anticipation. And I'd love to tell you it was a bunch of money and papers. It wasn't it. This is the riddle we'll never solve. Howling Wolf, the great blues man, had numerous Barbara Streisand piano songbooks in his suitcase. <laughs> so. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to Terry Stewart, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.